At the end of part one of this three-part series on the science of resilience and well-being, host Joe Sirio asks senior science writer at Forbes, Tanya Tarr, how people should start thinking about the how and why of their well-being. We'll pick up the conversation there. Lay out the your how and wow, and some of the things that people can almost reflect on, the questions that they can ask themselves yeah. about, well, how do I even do this? How do I think about my well-being? Yeah, so uh, Joe jo mentioned the how and the wow. So that stands for your house of well-being and your workplace of well-being. And there's an ancient Vedic saying um, which uh, a British writer popularized, and then I think uh, Gretchen Rubin mentioned it in one of her books, and I think that's how I found it. But it's it's this concept of a house of well-being that a person lives – uh, lives a full life when they move through the rooms in their house, which is the physical health, mental health, emotional health, and spiritual health. Um, and if we're in each of those rooms at least once a day or once a week, that that creates stability. Uh, it creates a vibrant life. Um, and so I adapted that. Um, I liked that model uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which is we as human beings <laughs> – we can only really deal with three or four objects at a certain time, like cognitive, cognitively, right? So, and I've seen people talk, oh, there's like seven and 12 forms of rest and all this other stuff. And I'm like, people cannot pay attention to that, right? Like, let's make something very nimble. Um, and so the House of Wellbeing is a tool that I use to help people do self-assessment around, you know, how am I moving through my physical health? How, I'm, how am I maintaining my physical health? How am I maintaining my mental health? And by mental, by the way, I should say it's cognitive health. Um, emotional health is, I think, where mental therapy, kind of talk therapy would go. Uh, but how am I ma maintaining my emotional health? And then how am I maintaining my cultural health? I think spirituality is a part of culture, but I felt like culture was a more inclusive name mm -hmm. for that room. And the difference between emotional and cultural is like emotional is how I feel internal to myself. So like personal hobbies where it's just me would go in that room. But cultural is like when I'm doing things with others, right? When I'm joining with others to do improv comedy or singing in a choir or whatever that may be, going to a soccer game. Um, and so what was interesting, and I've, I've taught uh, classes on this, especially around burnout recovery, and having people do that house of well-being assessment and going in and saying, okay, what, am I, what are the activities I'm doing you know, phys for my physical, mental, emotional, and cultural health? Um, it's been fascinating because it – has helped people it's made things so clear so quickly right like where am i spending most of my time and then the other piece of it that i think is so interesting is like the rooms that you can't get into are the ones you need to pay attention to mm -hmm. right so sometimes people are like oh i don't have anything for like the cultural room and i'm like okay well and that actually cultural room is the one that people tend to struggle with the most these days why is that I don't know. I think part of it is uh <laughs> I think well it's been what we've been talking about right so like People don't make time to make connection with others. Um, I think they're legitimately, and I say this as someone who identifies as an evangelical. like church was a big part of my life for a long time. And, and then things kind of changed and I felt out of alignment with those communities. And um, I found community other places. So for example, I practice Muay Thai traditional kickboxing and I'm very close with the people that I train with. And they serve, they are kind of my church energy. They are a community that I go to. Um, but I think a lot of the times people haven't, they don't have access to communities like we used to, right? They, they have to kind of either make it up on their own or they don't know even where to get started. But I would say like even adult kickball, like that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that is community, right? It serves that same purpose of helping you feel connected, of not feeling alone, of feeling a sense of trust and safety. If you think about some of those activities, yeah. adult kickball, yeah. uh, singing in a choir, yeah. Right. Not only is it cultural and interacting, it's also lung work. It's also physical. It's also hormonal release. It's feel good. Serotonin, uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and one thing I've, I've been convinced of for a long time, you kind of mentioned earlier, like, I've got to follow these 12 things and there's a six steps. And, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's all, exhausting. It's totally exhausting. <laughs> yeah. But I found that if you make one serious decision, and you don't even have to plan it as a gateway decision. It almost happens automatically. For example, if I decide not to eat five pizzas a week, mm -hmm. which I was doing, by the way, mm -hmm. at one point in my terrible, terrible health uh, journey. era, yeah. Yeah, journey, 
Um, I was eating five pizzas a week. And if I had a pizza for lunch, then I had a foot-long hero for dinner. And if I had a foot-long hero for lunch, I had a pizza for dinner. And I did that for months on end. And I gained a ton of weight. Yeah. And I felt terrible, and I got really, really sick. The only decision I made was to stop eating five pizzas a week and, con- and join that with moving my body three times a week yeah. for 20 minutes. That's yeah. it. Nothing strenuous. That's Didn't great. Didn't join any gyms. Nothing. Yeah. Okay? The impact of that, even just the pizzas alone, was lose weight, change my relationship to my money, yeah. change how I slept because I started feeling better because the weight started coming off. If I woke up in a better mood, then I was likely to communicate better. Mm-hmm. And step after step after step was, um, you know, they were all improved automatically. Yeah. I don't have to control every single thing in my world. Yeah. But I do have to get a couple of things right. Yeah, well, and this, I call those your home base metrics. So you understood what your home base metrics, all these goofy, <laughs> how, wow, home base. It's just to help you remember it. But yeah, no, exactly this. Like you used very good, first of all, you picked, you detected what was kind of like a linchpin. You understood the connection between food and not nourishing yourself in a way that actually made you feel good. You knew that, right, on some level. So you're like, okay, I'm going to make a small change right? But you are really smart in using heuristics, right? If I just do this one thing, this is the only thing I have to pay attention to, and then we'll have this positive cascading effect. Yeah. Uh, And that's what I'm trying to teach people too. And that's why we came up with the how and the wow is because it can be overwhelming. But the point is, first, let's like do a little bit of assessment, right? And this is going to sound like a goofy metaphor, but like I try to tell people like, you have to experience it, embody it, pay attention to it, poke at it a little bit. Um, one thing that uh, a actual like fashion stylist that I hired when I moved to Texas, <laughs> one thing that she, I promise this will make sense in a second. <laughs> yeah, uh, when I got here to Texas from the East Coast, uh, culturally I was not, not at all doing things the right way. Um, and so I hired a stylist to help me. And the first thing she had me do was a closet audit. And that was shocking to me. I was like, what? Like, I'm hiring you to help me buy clothes. She's like, no, we're going to go shopping in your closet first. And it was it was very helpful. Um, and I feel like this assessment or any self-assessment, you do the same thing. Because, again, I feel like in our culture, we're, we're being given consumer options without any regard to, like, what is going on? How do I figure out where I am right now before I add anything to the mix? So you were very smart in being like, I'm going to make this small adjustment And then I'm going to have myself do 20 minutes or 30 minutes twice a week, three times a week. Yeah. Very smart. Everything is very, it's a very, it's literally called a smart goal. It's like, you know, achievable, it's measurable, it's time bound, all those great things. Um, And so it's the same, I think with, I think the how is helping people because it's, it's easy, right? You just got these four buckets Mm -hmm. and they're somewhat um, exclusive of each other, but. They're also easy to understand. Yeah. You know, and people can identify in their daily life, okay, what is what is it, how does this quadrant, how does this bucket show up in my life in right. real terms? Yeah. So one of the things in, in my experience, before, I, before uh, I heard about how and wow and before we did training last month and probably about two years ago, it struck me to make a list. Yeah. The word environment popped up in my, in my mind. And I wanted to make a list of all of my environments. Mm. And the list went something like this. My bedroom environment, my bathroom environment, my bedroom closet environment, my bedroom desk environment, Mm -hmm. my office environment, my my office closet environment, my desk environment. I broke it all down into environments. And that's just what I call them, my car environment. Yeah. And then went further with my mind environment, my body environment, my food environment, all of the whole list. And I went through this exercise of examining, okay, where am I? Which ones are critical right now that I need to address immediately? Which ones I need to address, but not so crucial. So I'm not looking at everything at once. One thing I realized with my audiences is that a lot of people look at life as one huge single boulder coming at them and it's not the case (laughs) and also that would paralyze you if you're trying to make a change yeah no wonder you're freaked out i'm just gonna get flattened that's right right. Right. and there's so many things that aren't worth your energy they aren't worth your attention and those are smaller rocks that you just need to let pass by you 
Yeah. And there are some pretty sizable ones that really need addressing. Yeah. Health might be one of them. Health is absolutely uh, one of them. Clutter, yeah. absolute clutter on the verge of hoarding is one of them. Yeah. Like, how do I relate to my space? Yeah. And how does my space reflect me and, and how I'm feeling about myself? Yeah. And I found that to be a really useful exercise. It's yeah. kind of like the details of your four quadrants in the house of wellness. You want to know the another, house of well-being. The house of well-being. Yeah. You want another re- another reason why what you did worked is because we associate behaviors with locations. Mm. So that's another reason why your system works. It's well suited because we both attach meaning and behaviors and certain behaviors and habits can be easier in certain environments. Um, But the other piece of it is uh, the prioritization that you mentioned. That's a great point. If you think about work, if you think about your home office or your work office, and you have certain feelings or emotions around that space, and then you pick yourself up and go to a different space to work, and you're more productive or you're more focused or you feel better about yourself and about your work, yeah. might have something to do with what you're talking about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And this is the reason, too, why some people will try to stop a habit um, when they go and travel or when they move houses or offices. And it, it works for that type of person because I think it really connects to the type how your brain's wired. But for some people, that's super effective because you're changing into a new location. So it kind of cognitively and emotionally allows you to shed something because mm-hmm. you're coming into a new space. Mm-hmm. Um, the other piece of the the how and the wow um, that we did at your training uh, that seemed to help people is to help people understand transitions. This is kind of related to what you're talking about, right? So it's not just what am I doing? What activities am I doing to be healthy in these rooms? Um, By the way, that's like one level. I have like four different levels of how we use this framework. Um, Mm -hmm. But the first is sort of understanding, like, what are the good activities we're doing, right? And then the other piece of it is, as we're moving through our day, how are we paying attention to our transitions? So how am I opening and closing my day in my physical health or in my mental cognitive health or in my emotional health or in my cultural health? Like, how am I actually leveraging those four rooms as I open and close a day? Because if we're talking about chronic exhaustion or chronic stress, the reason why we why those situations cause us emotional, psychological, and physical harm is because our bodies are wired to look for beginnings and ends. This is why storytelling is how we learn. Mm. <laughs> it's how we evolved. So um, the other thing that seemed to help people is uh, is thinking about transitions on physical, mental, emotional, and cultural health. Um, it's connected to something called the doorway effect that's been studied quite a bit. Um, basically, if you've ever had a moment where you go from one end of your home to the other to, say, look for your keys or something like that, you walk through some doorways, and by the time you get to the other side of the house, you're like, wait, why am I here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this temporary forgetting. It's not a senior moment. Uh, it's actually when we walk through doorways, our brains reset, uh, and it's connected to what you're talking about lo- about location because we associate behaviors, and sometimes we also associate activities with a location. So when you change a location and you go through a door – your short-term mem- memory actually dumps itself. Like you for- it, it forces some forgetting, um, which is why you can't remember, why did I walk from one side of the house to the other? Because you've presented yourself with visual cues that actually cause you to dump your short-term memory. I like to say you can use this strategically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you feel overwhelmed, if you get up, walk around, walk through a doorway, you will actually kind of reset yourself a little bit. And so by observing observing transitions and making them intentional, um, you're helping not only create sort of better behaviors around managing your day, but you're also helping your nervous system and all your other systems in your body start and then end. Mm -hmm. Because when you don't end, you're not intentional about ending is where we run into problems, is where people have a sense of or fall into overwork patterns and things like that. So now you're on that that conveyor belt that never stops. And you have to keep up. And the hamster wheel, whatever whatever mechanism we want to use, right? Yeah. We're on that hamster wheel that we never get a break. Right. And we're not thinking about stopping and ending and then starting. Which got completely out of hand during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Completely out of hand. And now we're seeing conversations about – return to office, right? And what causes us to do that or why should we do that? Or, you know, and there's there's kind of like pros and cons. Uh, maybe 
it'd be good to talk about the workplace of well-being now. We will, we will in, okay. one, in one second. Yeah. So, uh, so just to uh, give one uh, quick transition. So one of the most effective ones that I used was uh, being on the road so much and training all over the country. I would get home at 11 o'clock midnight. Yeah. And I would have been gone two, three, four days. And I had to sit in the parking lot of my apartment complex and just take a couple of minutes yeah. and think about, number one, leaving behind the road because now I'm home. Right. And number two, my wife is inside. And for the last three or four days, she's been doing nothing but waiting for me to come home. Right. She's been working. She's been doing right. But yeah. but emotionally, she's just been waiting for me to come home. Yeah. And if I walk in the door as a continuation of my training and a continuation of my travel and I walk in the door feeling sorry for myself and, OK, I'm home, I'm exhausted, I'm so tired, it's been so hard for me. You know, what reaction am I going to get from her? Yeah. And I haven't stopped to transition from, hey, wait a second, the world I'm coming from is different from the world I'm walking into. Yeah. And my priorities and my emotional connection is different as much as I love being on the road and as much as I love training, the home environment is a different place with different needs and different kind of requirements, different emotional requirements. Yeah. And, I, and one thing that I talk to my audiences about is when you're going to work, you can do the same thing. And you can give yourself five minutes, three minutes more than usual and get to work, sit in the parking lot yeah. and go through this conscious transition of, oh, the place I'm about to walk into is X, Y, Z. And I know I'm going to see this person and that person. This one I love is wonderful. This one is difficult. And I have to start getting myself in the mindset of understanding, you know, my emotional intelligence. How am I going to self-regulate when this person shows up with their nonsense? Right, yeah. What, what I perceive to be their nonsense. Sure. Right? Yeah. And I, I love the point about transitions because they're so powerful. Yeah. And I think to If your, you pay attention to them. To your point. <laughs> and we don't. Right, right. To your point, we just yeah. have this nonstop ongoing, everything is kind of the same. Yeah. And we need to distinguish and take a break and breathe. Yeah. And also, there's like a lot of, not to sound fluffy, there's a lot of joy that can happen there too. Yeah. Oh, so for sure. One of my clients, she um, is uh, executive director of a of a big nonprofit, and she uh, colors with her kids before dinner. That's how they transition. They've got two young children, and so just stuff like that. You know, activities in that moment that you take. And we're back to the earlier point, right? It's transition. Yeah. With connection, yeah. with emotion, with support, with giving the children a sense that parents are there. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So. Um, We've been talking about house of well-being, yeah, and now we want to talk about workplace of well-being. Yes, because everything's lovely at home. That's where I want to be, hopefully. <laughs> but now I've got to go into the workplace, and I'm dealing with people I don't like, and they're not people I chose, and I, you know, the policies are ridiculous. And sometimes and it can be reversed too. The home life is a wreck, and the work life is true. where I escape. For sure. Yeah. Join us next month when Joe Serio and his guest senior science writer at Forbes. Tanya Tarr conclude their conversation about the science of resilience and well-being with how to improve and support well-being at work. That's it for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in and digging deep into what's ahead for the future as the whole you. We'll be back next month with Joe for another episode. But until then, visit his website for additional information at joeserio.com. And remember, don't let the shift hit your plans.